Hi, everyone. Uh, we are about to get started at 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this webinar on strengthening communities through regional programs and broadcast initiatives. My name is Jack Deluca, and I'm the Media Arts Director here at the National Endowment for the Arts. Today's webinar is part of, ser of a series of conversations around the state of the field, a report from the Documentary Sustainability Summit, a recent NEA report released in partnership with the International Documentary Association back in August. The report outlines key issues and recommendations for the field with the goal of helping the field articulate tangible, actionable strategies and initiatives that contribute to a sustainable and healthy ecosystem for documentary professionals. The report is available for download as a PDF or as a printed publication from our website at arts.gov slash publications, which is also seen on the screen here. For any groups requesting more than one printed copy of the report, feel free to send us an email at mediaarts at arts.gov and we'll send you a box. Also, if you'd like additional resources around the report, we have an archived recording of an earlier webinar that gives a brief report overview with special guest Simon Kilmery, the Executive Director of IDA, and Michael Bracey, who is one of the lead consultants for the report and the Documentary Sustainability Summit. Another archive webinar as part of the series was focused on supporting independent productions through film rebate and tax incentive programs, which also features a stellar lineup. So we encourage you to visit our website, go to the webinars section, and see what we have on there. Um, all right, so uh, getting back to today's conversation. So we're about to speak with a panel of experts about best practices in the field for strengthening communities through regional programs and broadcast initiatives. The purpose of today's conversation is to raise awareness of existing models in the field and demonstrate how they benefit artists and communities. So I'm incredibly honored to introduce Sue Shart, Teresa Hollingsworth, and Chris Hastings. We are so excited to have you on here today to share your knowledge and experience. So uh, thanks for being with us, everyone. Before we get started into the presentation, I'd like to have everyone go around and have the panelists take a moment to briefly introduce themselves and their background. I'm going to start with Sue Shart. Sure. Thank you, Jax. I'm very happy to be here with you all today. Uh, I am, as you see on the slide, it tells you my title. I don't need to repeat that, but I'll, I'll tell you uh, just for quickly, um, AIR is a network of 1,300 producers. Uh, we have an audio centricity, um, but are increasingly working in this blended media environment. And the focus of AIR and the work that I've been building here for 10 years now is to recruit a new generation of talent. Um, our programs are focused on cultivating and really strengthening, particularly in the multimedia field, and then deploying our, our, our producers and our talent across the, the country to work on projects, to fill newsrooms, um, to serve in executive positions, et cetera. So I'm very happy to be here representing AIR. Fantastic. We're happy to have you on here as well. All right. Next, we have Teresa Hollingsworth. Hi, this is Teresa Hollingsworth. I'm the Senior Program Director at South Arts. We are located in Atlanta. Um, I direct our film and traditional arts programs. I want to say a special thanks to NEA, Jax, and uh, both of the Sarahs at uh, NEA. We are delighted for South Arts and Southern Circuit to be a part of the State of the Field Report, and also participating in this webinar series. And I look forward to uh, speaking in greater detail about our Southern Circuit Tour of Independent Filmmakers. Fantastic. Thanks, Teresa. Um, and the Sarahs are here, and they say thank you, too. <laughs> so uh, Chris Hastings, we'll have you on next. Hello. Uh, I'm Chris Hastings, Executive Producer for World Channel. Uh, which is actually based at WGBH Television in Boston. Um, I've been at GBH for a little under 15 years, at World Channel for about five. And my role is 
uh, unique in that I am responsible for all content on World Channel, which is a digital broadcast channel that reaches uh, nationally within the U.S. Um, I think our mission is pretty clear, um, to be another doorway, uh, another access point, an enhancement to PBS. Um, and I think we've been doing that successfully since 2007. Um, primarily a broadcast channel, but it's also a digital platform. Um, and I think one of the things that we want to make sure that we share in this webinar is that this is a great opportunity for media creators around the country. Awesome. Perfect. Well, we're so excited to have you guys on here. It's such a stellar lineup. And uh, each of you are really coming from different corners of the field. So I thought it would be useful to have each of you talk a little bit more. We'll give you about seven to ten minutes to talk a little bit about the work that you're doing um, so people on the call can learn more um, about about your work. Um, and we'll get right into it. So um, we're going to start off with Sue Sharp. And uh, I'll let you take it from, from here. Um, I'm going to pass over the presentation to you. Thanks very much. So um, if we're talking about strengthening communities and doing it in a sustainable way, um, coming off of the meeting last August where we were very stimulated um, after a day of talking with each other about sustaining the documentary field and how to achieve that. Um, we think a lot about sustainability at AIR. Uh, most of the talent in our network are navigating the freelance economy. Most of our producers are freelance um, producers, um, and so we spend a lot of time and um, energy thinking about this, and it's a changing world. So um, if there's one point that I want to make today, it's that in order, what we've learned is that in order to create a sustainable and ongoing enterprise, you have to fill a need. You really have to be solving a problem, whether you're working in a local community or uh, on a national production, whatever it might be. But this has to be ground zero if sustainability is your goal. And, you know, many, what we see in our universe is, you know, many, um, ta much of our talent get, they get lit up with a new idea. They set out on a path. Uh, but they skip this really important strategic step of asking the question, what difference am I trying to make and to whom? So this has to be part of an investigation, um, not to validate your idea or what you're really excited about, but to genuinely explore what you're going to try to solve. Um, so the local or production um, is something we embarked on in 2010. Um, it's now evolved over seven years into three national productions um, that are iterative, so each one builds on the previous. So from the start, the problem we were trying to solve with local or to begin with was the fact that there wasn't enough room or a mindset for experimentation in public media. That's what we recognized. And it was a time of great technological disruption that continues to this day that really demands experimentation and taking risks. So we set out to, to begin to build in what we called innovation capacity at the system in, within public broadcasting. And each iteration of the production um, led us really to a different problem we were trying to solve. The last production uh, we completed uh, last November, Finding America, um, was one where we embedded independent-led production teams at radio and, station, radio and television stations across the country. And the problem these latest teams were taking on was how to take public media into the far corners of local communities where the public broadcasting outlet had little to no presence. So our, our producers, um, working closely with the station, was, were charged with inventing new forms of making stories with and for the people living there. And ultimately, the aspiration that we share is the realization of the founding vision of a public media that serves all of the people of the United States. So if you take collectively what it is we were trying to achieve in these micro-communities, these hyper-local um, um, neighborhoods, 
Um, this is really the vision that we all shared on the team. The other thing the teams all shared was the, the assignment. So they all had um, completely different um, communities uh, where they were embedded. I won't go into them all. I'll share some resources later where you can read a lot more about each production. Um, but they each had a completely different community, um, both in terms of the nature of who was living there and also the approaches that they developed. But each team had the same assignment, and three of the elements of the assignment that was the same in building these local, hyper-local projects were that each, each of them had to approach the work with what we call the, a full-spectrum mindset. That is to say, um, there are so many ways to tell a story in today's world. We need to simultaneously invent a model that uses broadcast, digital, and what we call street platform or the, in the physical space of the community. So each of the producers, they're in told it was 150 people across the whole field, had to approach the work with that, with that attitude. The second part of the assignment was that they had to identify what we, again, call a far corner of the community. So that was something that was quite interesting and quite rich because when we consider um, the neighborhoods where public media wasn't necessarily deeply engaged, it was often the neighborhoods, um, and we all know them, um, where the day-to-day -day news, not public media necessarily, but, you know, the day-to-day -day news of local outlets is all about the murders in that place or the house fires there last night or the, the bad things that go on in that neighborhood. So that was the nature of the communities where we were located. The third element of the assignment was quite interesting, and we call it repose. And that was to say to the producers, when they began their work right from the get-go, the first part of their assignment, understanding that they were going to be entering a place of the community where they didn't necessarily look like the, the folks who live there, didn't necessarily speak the same language, their job was to go out into the streets, leave their, their cameras, leave their microphones, leave behind what they know how to do and just observe and absorb. And do that until they began to understand and, and realize something of the rhythm of the place and how the place flowed and who the significant people were living there. And then begin to work on the stories and begin on, begin working to identify um, how they would set about building these models. So um, six months into the assignment, we began to see what became a flourishing of live events. Um, and I guess it's in hindsight, it's not surprising, but at the time it was a little bit, it wasn't something we expected. Um, so with these very sophisticated multi-platform productions, what we began to understand with this live, the emergence of these live events, we began to understand the primacy not of social media platforms, but of social platforms. Gyms, churches, mosques, food pantries, courthouses, hot dog wagons. So as we, we, as we understood that, that this was happening with this sort of simultaneous convergence of what we recognized as a new constituency for us to understand, we invited Edison Research to come in to generate polling data on the people from the communities where we were embedded. And um, most of people coming to our live events, and I think I just said this, but I'll say that there were more than 30 live events we ended up producing, um, very different kinds of events at a roller skating rink, a drive-in movie theater, um, stand-up storytelling events. Um, but most of the people who came lived within a five-mile radius of our events. And I don't have time, certainly, to, to review all of the Edison data, but we conducted fascinating benchmark research. Um, and three of the findings um, I've got up here. And basically, um, Tom Webster, Edison, describes this really important cohort called Switched On, Tuned In. These are the people living in the communities who are often um, the people who are the community organizers or they're running the arts center or they have some significant role in the community who act as our, as our, co as our Sherpa. They're leading us into the community, validating the work and helping lead us where we need to go. Again, the importance of live platforms 
And the data that he surfaced really emphasized and really surfaced new um, information about the importance of the local market as the future of public for, for public broadcasting. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, here are some resources for you. Um, we, the, the image on the right, some of you may have received our report. We have a report out called Local or, or, or called Break Form, Making Stories With and For the People. Um, if you don't have a copy, I would invite you to get in touch with me. We're happy to send you copies. We've sent out 10,000 copies across the country um, to funders, to freelancers, to independent filmmakers, stations, journalists. So we'd be happy to supply you with some of those if you're interested. And I'll leave it at that. I look forward to questions if you have them. Great. Thanks, Sue. That was a really great overview. And for anybody who has not read this report, I highly recommend it. I have taken it on three trips with me so far. It's very dense, but also very readable and exciting. And there's some fun findings in there. So I think that I think that's essential reading right now for anybody in this field. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, and the paper copy is great. I've marked mine up extensively. So um, there's a lot there. So thank you, Sue. Uh, I look forward to uh, talking more about this work um, in the conversational aspect afterwards um, in the moderated discussion, shall we? Okay, so moving on, I'll just stop there. <laughs> so Teresa Hollingsworth is up next uh, presenting, and Teresa comes from a different corner of the universe. She is speaking in her role at a, state, at a regional arts organization, and so um, she's going to give you a little bit about how they're uh, intersecting with communities. Teresa, I'm going to pass... Uh, the dial over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Jax. Um, a little bit about South Arts. As Jax mentioned, we are one of six regional nonprofit arts organizations in the country. And there are two organizations that work with filmmakers and communities to present independent film. Uh, and we are one of those. We do work in nine southern partner states. And as an organization, we do work with a number of different art um, disciplines, uh, including performing, literary, and visual arts. Uh, but more on our background in film. Um, the Southern Circuit Tour of Independent Filmmakers actually has been around for well over 30 years. Um, it originated with the South Carolina Arts Commission in 1975. And they worked um, on and off for a number of years touring new independent film and the filmmakers um, to organizations and communities in South Carolina and the border states. In 2006, South Arts adopted the program, and we were able to expand it to nine states. Uh, this is actually our 10th season. And we do work a little bit differently than um, the film festival platform. Uh, filmmakers actually go with their work to communities. We do pay filmmakers um, a artist honorarium. Uh, we provide um, the expenses for all of their travel. Um, all of our filmmakers are based in the United States. Film subject matter can be about anything. It isn't a program that is just for Southern-based filmmakers, and it isn't subject matter um, that is just about the South. Um, currently, this season, which is the 2017-2018 season, we have 123 screenings scheduled in 21 communities. We are touring 18 independent films um, and filmmaking teams. Our primary art form happens to be documentaries. Of the 18 films that we're touring this year, eight, um, 17 of those films are documentaries. And for us, as Sue mentioned earlier, uh, where her work went into communities in cities that people don't necessarily have access and aren't using uh, public broadcasting to its fullest extent, we, too, go into um, perhaps what you would consider much, much smaller communities. Uh, many of these communities don't have access to commercial movie theaters, um, let alone an independent film house. They don't have physical access to a film festival. A lot of times people aren't even aware 
of the uh, breadth of independent and documentary film that's being created in this country. Um, we do work in a lot of different types of venues within communities, colleges and universities, uh, small performing arts centers, historic theaters, churches, museums, community centers. Um, and a very important part of the Southern Circuit Program is actually working with our community partners. Um, our partners are part of their role is serving as curator. Films and filmmakers are not assigned to our screening partners and communities. Our partners actually help to select the films that will be screened uh, because they know their audience. They know their community. Um, we as programming um, administrators don't know who all the people are that they are working with. So developing these partnerships have been very important to us. All of our screening partners are also required to develop other partnerships um, to present Southern Circuit films. We have had great success working with county libraries, with public schools, and not just the Board of Education office, but with specific educators, clubs, departments um, in public schools. The same thing holds true for both uh, private and public colleges and universities. We work with um, specific academic programs and departments and organizations on campus. We work with small government um, offices, including a number of mayor's offices. And also, even in some of the smallest communities you might visit in the South, there are often convention and visitors bureaus. So we also work with, um, with those particular programs. Um, we have discovered that with audience development, this is an important key with Southern Circuit. Um, we want to encourage audiences to, of course, attend our screenings, but then we want them to go home and seek other opportunities um, to discover and explore independent and documentary films, whether it be through streaming services or through their local um, public television provider. Um, with the filmmakers that we work with, the Q&As are an incredibly important part of that interaction. Um, all of our filmmakers are required to participate in an audience Q&A, but then we also work with our uh, screening partners to develop informal opportunities also. Uh, some people may be hesitant, quite frankly, to raise their hand and ask a question in front of um, an audience, even if it's composed of their neighbors. So we do try to develop opportunities for filmmakers to have um, informal interaction with community members. We also work with them um, to develop um, activities that might be as simple as a filmmaker um, having coffee at the local community center or perhaps a filmmaker going with a group of uh, students post-screening um, to have pizza to further discuss the art of filmmaking and the subject matter in that film. Uh, for us, as far as our work with filmmakers is concerned, m most of our filmmakers are screening for audiences that they probably would never have the opportunity to encounter. We go to communities such as Ruston, Louisiana, Barberville, Kentucky, Johnson City, Tennessee. Um, we do work in a couple of larger metropolitan areas, but so much of the South is isolated. Um, we are currently screening in uh, four communities in Appalachia. So this is very much um, an area where, which is underserved uh, by all of the arts, um, in particular with film. Even though our friends and uh, partners at Apple Shop that many of you all are familiar with have been doing incredible work for um, almost 50 years now. I guess this is um, their 50th anniversary. Um, I did want to mention some other opportunities, um, and I want to go back to what I mentioned earlier about the opportunities for Q&As. We believe that um, 
the post-screening Q&As provide a safe space for public discussion and for um, civil discourse, which is something that we believe is very important, um, especially in the times that we're living in. It's been our experience that documentary films can provide a um, opening point for many discussions uh, for for communities that they need to have, that they want to have. They haven't necessarily had the opportunity though previously. Um, so we have been we continue to work in this um, in this manner. I also wanted to mention the work of another regional arts organization, the Mid Atlantic Arts Foundation in Baltimore, Maryland. They do have a similar program called On Screen and In Person. They are currently in their 17-18 um, season, but recently opened the opportunity um, for filmmakers to apply for their coming season. I do want to mention that our call for 2018-2019 screening partners will open in mid-November of this year and on January 1st of 2018. We will be opening our call for filmmakers interested in working with us for our coming season. Um, additional information can be found on our website at southarts.org. And I look forward to questions. Great. Uh, thanks, Teresa. That's um, an exciting introduction, too, for some people who it might be their first time uh, thinking about the regional arts organizations as being part of this ecosystem. So we're so glad to have you on this call. Um, so Chris Hastings, we have you up next. And uh, you're also coming from another unique position, coming from um, World Channel. So I'm going to pass it on to you to tell us a little bit about your world. Cool. <laughs> that was cheesy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so World Channel, um, in its simplest form, is a broadcast uh, television uh, station uh, that is distributed nationally throughout the PBS system on 149 stations. Um, as of today, we're reaching about 70% of the country. Um, and for those of you, when I say multicast, World Channel in many markets is the secondary channel within a particular market. Um, so when we think of um, Boston, for instance, World Channel is uh, the secondary broadcast channel. And what that means is free over-the-air broadcast. Um, on the cable system, it's a second dairy PBS channel in some cases. Um, it's had this placement uh, since 2007 when the U.S.'s um, analog television broadcast system at the time switched over to digital. It opened up the opportunity for broadcasters to put out additional content over um, broadcasts in multicast. And so World Channel um, has been around for a really long time, but it really didn't get to have a a really clear mission until the Corporation for Public Broadcasting uh, started funding World Channel in 2011 with a clear mission of adding diversity to the public media system on the television side. And so since 2011, 2012 when I got here, our mission has been to really um, enhance diversity within the PBS system. And I think uh, since we started that mission with CPB support, uh, we have grown on leaps and bounds. Um, now, to do that, the one of the things that we tried to do was really make sure we understood what the opportunities were. Uh, what was it that wasn't getting into the PBS system that people really wanted? Um, and it was pretty clear to us that it was looking out and, and working with independent creators around the country. Uh, when you think about independent lens and POV, uh, these are serious to air on PBS. Uh, but those shows, they, they get a limited number of slots per year. The one thing that I found when I came on is that there is so much other content that's being produced, and it's being distributed, and it happens to air on different PBS stations at different times around the country. The opportunity that we saw was an op was to, what can we do as a, as a national broadcaster to curate that content, to really give uh, content that isn't necessarily 
going to make it to POV, to IL, um, uh, a first-tier um, distribution. And so we started sort of organizing this, this process a little bit where we work with um, our partners with the, at PBS, our partners um, around the country who are working with independent filmmakers, funding independent filmmakers in some cases, and trying to figure out what are the opportunities here. Um, and through this work over the past couple of years, we've been extremely successful in rebranding the channel, giving it its own identity, world channel, um, and really putting out there an extension of PBS, um, a new and, and, and innovative service that is when you look at our audience, we reach about 35 million people a year just over broadcast TV. That doesn't include digital. Uh, we've created a service that I think has a clear identity. Um, that really calls on uh, the diversity of America to be a part of the conversation. Um, and it, it's a huge enhancement to public media and to PBS in that you get the main service on PBS, which is you have your clear strands, Nova, POV, Frontline, Independent Lens, American Experience. But then over the past couple of years, we have our own strands that we've, that we've put into the market. And through this work over the past five or six years, we've been extremely successful with our, with our strands. And I'm going to talk about each of them. Um, I'm happy to report that through the work. Over the past couple of years, we've been honored with three Emmy nominations. Uh, this would be, these are new nominations, but over the years, we've won a few different awards for our, for our films that we've curated in with independent filmmakers. I think the great opportunity for independent filmmakers in working with us is that it's a clear partnership in what we're doing. We acquire films. We work with the filmmakers to put it out there. We submit them for awards. And I think in, in some sort of clear way, uh, we're opening the door a bit wider for independent content to make it within the PBS system. Uh, and so through this effort, we want to reward not only the filmmaker, but also the opportunity by getting the sort of recognition that the work deserves. Um, so real quick, I'm going to go through our three strands. Uh, some of you may know about them. Uh, they've been pretty buzzy in what they've been putting out in, for individual films. Um, America Framed was our first flagship series. This is being produced or co-curated with American Documentaries, the executive producer of POV. Uh, we started this in 2012 uh, with a clear mission, to curate stories of a changing America. Um, and successfully, we're going into our sixth season starting in January. We are currently taking submissions for that new season at worldchannel.org. Um, and, you know, over the past couple of years, this series continues to sort of perform. Um, when we think about the number of slots that we're putting out every year, the opportunity here is, is uh, immense for independent filmmakers who have complete films, but you don't quite know where they're going to go. Um, I think the series really does speak to the mission of the channel. Uh, to be able to bring in these sort of regional and local stories that have a national f impact. And we've been really successful and really want to make sure that we let independent filmmakers and organizations around the country who are working and capturing stories, that this is a, one opportunity for you at World Channel. Our second series, which we started a year after America Frame, looks to tell smaller stories or shorter stories uh, with a, a national impact um, on a national platform. Local USA is looking for films and short content under 30 minutes. We use this series as an opportunity to build partnerships with local stations, local arts organizations, local public media organizations like AIR, um, particularly when independent filmmakers and independent journalists are working on stories that tend to be shorter. Um, whereas America Frame is longer films, Local USA is about the short form content. I can remember when we started this series, it started out where every episode was a single theme and we'd go around to different public media stations and figure out if they had content on a particular theme. As we've evolved it over the past couple of years, we've been doing uh, single half hours, uh, like the film Forever Chinatown, which premiered last May, which was an ITVS funded film. Um, I think the clear sort of distinction for Local USA is that it's short-form content. 
and it's produced by independent makers or local stations or other arts organizations around the country where they're creating content. Uh, next series that we started just last year uh, is called Doc World, and this is an opportunity to bring content not only that might be produced by a U.S. maker, but it might be produced by a public media institution or independent maker in another country. And so when you look at how we're programming the channel, we try very much to make sure we're bringing in domestic voices but also international voices. And a lot of times, a lot of independent filmmakers who are working here are working across our borders. But when they bring it back to the U.S., the question has always been, where does it live within the U.S. market? And so we're really trying to make sure that we're including those voices on the channel as well. Um, a new thing that we just started that is going to bring in uh, artists who are storytellers, um, called Stories from the Stage, actually just launched on Monday. Uh, it's an opportunity where we are literally making a show off of storytelling, much like The Moth or Snap Judgment on radio. This is meant to sort of curate that content on the stage for video and for television. Um, and it's a great opportunity, I think, to work with local arts organizations around the country, but also it's going to be an opportunity where we work with independent filmmakers to shoot this content. So we're always looking for to find new talent to work with, to bring in and work within the World Channel system. World Channel, as I said before, it's, it's about partnership. We can't do this work, we can't share this work without having good partners. Uh, the proof of performance here in doing this is that we we talked about 34 million. Uh, we are upping our ratings consistently for the strands that are coming through PBS. Um, our audience is pretty young compared to PBS. 52% uh, of the world's audience is 18 to 49. Um, and this all happens because diversity makes us better. And so World Channel's diversity shows that we're making an impact. Um, in partnering with independent makers, we try really hard to make sure that this isn't just a broadcast opportunity. We're working really hard on the digital side, making sure that we're doing um, consistent digital events, like our hashtag events that we do at PBS and some of the uh, National Minority Consortia, and I can talk about that later, uh, to doing station events, building partnerships locally to make sure that the content is not only broadcasting locally, but also that stations have enough collateral locally that they can hold their own local events with the filmmaker. And so as over the past couple of years, we're trying to make sure that not only is this brand here and available on broadcast, but it's available on digital as well. Um, and that's about it. I'm looking for your questions. It's pretty innovative in what we're doing in that we're putting curation first, but the partnerships that we're building, um, I, I, my day usually starts with having one partnership conversation and ending with another because we're always trying to find new ways to work with independent creators but also partners who are funding independent creators to get national distribution. And I'm happy to talk more about that. That's great. Thank you, Chris. I feel like we just learned a lot over here, too. So uh, part of this is really about giving people an idea of the already existing structures and programs that are already in, happening right now because it's hard to keep track of all, all of these moving parts that are happening that make up this field because it's so expansive. Um, and then part of that really ties to the report in terms of peer network building. That was something um, that came up a lot of just like sharing and uh, learning from each other, and that's essential to um, leading to us all working together in new ways, figuring out how to align resources, and sharing best practices for the benefit of the field as a whole. So this has just been really enlightening um, on our end, too. So um, I have a question for each of you to just uh, – learn a little bit about you as a person doing this work. What are motivating factors for each of you in your work, and what's the passion that's driving driving all of this? Um, we have kind of a rare opportunity to get a, a, a glimpse of that from you. So I'm going to start. I'm going to give this one to Chris first. For me, my passion comes from that I believe PBS and public media and PR needs to be more diverse. I think the platforms that we have, um, it needs to be able to – be reflective of the America we live in. Um, we're public media, and so for me, when I came into public media in 2002, I came from BET. I was looking to go to a place where, at some point, public media should look more like me and my family. 
And I think the stories that we are sharing uh, need to be more reflective of that. Um, so when you look at America Reframe, the whole, you know, entryway there is the, it's the stories of a change of America, and I, I wholeheartedly believe that. I'll jump in. This is Teresa. Um, I think for us it really is twofold. Um, first of all, we have the opportunity to work with some fantastic um, documentary uh, filmmakers. And for so many of them, they have never had the opportunity to screen in the South um, or to work with Southern audiences. Um, and I, um, we have an evaluation process that we do work with our filmmakers on, and it's always amazing to me um, just what they've discovered about the region and about how many uh, perhaps stereotypes um, and misconceptions have been put aside because of how the region is often um, reflected in popular culture. Not that we don't have issues. But it's wonderful to see that gap um, uh, become less so, to bring these audiences and these filmmakers together. I think the second thing is, is just to see how excited audiences are um, and to have the opportunity to experience incredible storytelling um, and the opportunity to gather as an audience, as um, I think that there will always be the desire for live art um, in our country, whether it's people gathering for a, a theater event or for a concert performance. I think the same holds true for film and that people still do actually want to come together uh, to experience film. So my answer would be twofold. Um, and I guess that leaves me. <laughs> um, this is Sue. Um, I guess, you know, when you ask that question, there, the, I would say there, there are probably three things I would, I would say, Jax, right now, because there are many things I'm very excited about. Number one is I'm, I'm one of those people who thrive in chaos. And, and I think we're truly in a time of, of chaos where the chips haven't fallen yet. We, we haven't succeeded. Um, you just look to podcasting, for example, um, or any any of the medium that we work in. There's not really – we haven't yet consolidated around a way to measure things because of the rise of social the social web and so many factors that are just creating these conditions of disruption. So what I understand about chaos and what I've what, – you know, if you look at science, for example, chaos is an actual state – that they describe in physics as being a state that is highly sensitive to influence. So one of the things that's super exciting is understanding that we have this moment in time to be super intentional about shaping the future in media. So that's number one. The second thing I would echo what Chris is saying in that, so what's the, what's the, if we're going to be influential and intentional, what are, what's the end game? What are we aiming for? And it really is about this moment in time where we can set into motion um, uh, the, the building blocks for establishing a more sophisticated culture of inclusivity, mm -hmm. not just in media, but throughout in the, in the country, the way that we can influence and shape the country itself if we understand that we're in that position. Right? So that's the second thing. And I think the third thing I would say, you know, it goes to what you're saying, Teresa, which is really that I have the most unbelievable position to be working with so much amazing talent. And we have a whole new generation. You know, one of the things at AIR and with Local or in particular, we're, we're, it's a magnet for an incredibly passionate group of mission-focused talent that we can cultivate and who are going to be, they're our future. Um, the local producers, the lead produce, production team that we have is 73% women and 43% producers of color. And I get to work with these people, and it is the greatest honor, and it's one of the most humbling parts of my job um, is I call them my gurus. You know, I just learn so much about all my, my failings and my weaknesses and also my strengths, but... Um, that's, you know, that, that cannot be understated, how exciting it is to work with such amazing new people. 
Great. Thanks, Sue. Uh, wow. So, yeah, you each are coming from, from this sort of su such amazing uh, spots in the field, too, so it's really refreshing to hear your perspectives. Um, each of you kind of spoke a little bit about the increasing importance of in-person events and physical spaces and the social connection as part of an overall distribution strategy in addition to all of the digital platforms that are happening. Um, I just wanted to hand it over to you guys to expand a little bit more on that. Um, Chris, I'll start with you again. Well, I think any distribution has to be multi-platform. And the in-person events, you know, whether it's a festival like Sundance or a local station event or a screening at a church like Quest did in North Philly a couple of weeks ago, it's important for me that public media lives on all platforms and in those personal communities, in those communities, that's one way to bring in an audience that currently might not exist on TV or radio at NPR and PBS. And so if you can take a film – to a local community, and you can meet up with someone who's under 30, maybe a single parent working 50 hours a week, and but they go to church every week, and they got to learn about, learn about Quest at that church. That's a win for public media. But if we just assume that they're going to come on POV and see it at 10 o'clock at night after they're working long hours, that's not opening the door for everybody. So I think it's important as a multi-platform distribution for independent content that we build those opportunities in, not only for engagement, but because that's what we should be doing to make sure we're bringing in an audience that might not be able to sit down and do tune in or download an app or pay the broadband fee. And I was going to mention, um, you mentioned um, Quest, Chris. We're very excited. We're, we're actually um, touring the, the film in spring of, of 2018. And um, so we're very, we're very excited about that. And I think with so much of the storytelling um, and so often when people get together, to watch films or to experience art. It's a great opportunity to learn that we are much more alike than we are different totally. um, from from one another, and I think that that is something that is heartening um, in what can be some very uh, disturbing and dark days um, that some of us are experiencing. So I think that um, by having these opportunities and, and having non-traditional spaces for people to gather, that that is such an important part of all of this. Um, and I guess, you know, m my experience has been um, going back to what I described earlier, which is, you know, this idea that we've discovered the primacy not of social media platforms, but social platforms. And so um, I'll just, I'll give one example. In terms of local lore and our intent to build new models, right, to experiment with new mo models for how public media can be in a local community. I was in Milwaukee um, for one of our live events. It was one of the more standard approaches where it was a, in the PAP Theater, which if you've ever been in Milwaukee, it's this giant, beautiful theater that holds hundreds of people. It was three days after the, the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando, and mm -hmm. the focus of our evening was – um, gun violence, right? It's called Precious Lives, um, um, and it was the live show. And what happened in that theater that night was that WUWM, which is the public radio station we partnered with, um, um, hosted this event. Brad Lichtenstein and his team produced it. Um, and it was this extraordinary evening where we had on the stage um, eight or ten teenagers who talked about, told stories, danced, you know, wept, you know, recited poetry, performed the experience of what it was to, to live on a day-to-day -day basis with gun violence, where they'd seen their fathers and their brothers and their, their aunts and that, you know, everyone had been deeply touched and talked about the fear of what it is, right, in the shadow of Orlando and these big, you know, momentous events. And, and what we experienced there that night was that this public radio station called out, you know, you know, um, broadcast and sent across digital um, platforms, you know, hundreds of messages to their core audience, the white, highly affluent, educated core audience in that community, brought them into the theater, 
half the theater was that audience, and the other half of the theater were the families, the friends, the support system for these kids. And it was the first time that these two constituencies had come together around a shared concern to observe and experience this. And it was under the banner of public media. And in this way, uh, you know, you could really see and understand how public media in the live space of the community, without, it's not too complex, but they can, they can, they can, they can become a, a different kind of convener, convener off the airwaves, off the digital platform, and in that physical space in a way that few uh, organizations or entities can possibly do in a neighbor, in, in, a, in a community. So that's, that's just one example of, of public media as a new convener of a community. That's brilliant, Sue. It also sounds like it was um, a wonderful opportunity for healing in addition to discussion. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, Teresa. Yeah, I agree. So that that's a great example. And I think more increasingly these barriers are coming down between what is uh, – falling in a certain place between broadcasting live event or even in other disciplines. It's all emerging in different ways because of this digital transition we have, too. And I, I think it's bringing people together in new ways, and there's a more need to connect um, and find people in a way um, and, and, and bring it all together. So, um, gosh, this has been such an enlightening conversation. We're going to open this up to the public for questions, we have a really fancy little icon up at the top, which recognizably looks like a Q&A icon. If you click on that, you can submit a question. We've already gotten a few, so um, I'm just going to flip right over to there because it's 3.52 and we need to end. Um, we'll probably end around 4.03, something like that, 4.04 if we're getting wild. So um, I'm going to pass this over to Sarah Metz and Sarah Burford, who are our trusty media arts specialists here at the NEA, and they will be um, uh, doing the question portion here. So I'm going to pass this over to Sarah Burford. Thank you, Jax. Hi, everyone. Our first question uh, expressed appreciation for Chris's remarks about a need for increased diversity in the stories we share, uh, which you all have touched upon in your presentations. and. Uh, the question asks if any of the panelists have surface-specific story ideas or identified um, a gap in stories that were being told during engagement events or audience feedback, particularly in regions that are outside of coastal and metropolitan markets. Um, and in addition to that, um, are there resources that you might point someone to for program development and producer mentorship? And I'll just um, open that up to the panel here. <laughs> yeah, so I would say, Michael, this is you. Um, I would say, you know, I'm, ha I'm happy to send copies of our report to you. I think there are a lot of rich um, – There, it's designed as a sharing out best practices. Um, that would be a great resource. I'm happy to send as many copies as you like, um, or you can download them on the website as well. Um, I think that um, – um, and then AIR itself is a network where we, we have mentoring, we have trainings, um, et cetera. So, you know, reach out if you want to find out more about that. I would say that, um, you know, in terms of story gaps, I'm not it, – it's, here's one thing when, I, when, I, when I'm looking at your question. I think that one thing that what we learned and what we're – what we've developed and learned is that, you know, when we go into communities, again, to my earlier remarks, where you're going into a community that's defined usually by in, through this narrow lens of violence or injustice or, you know, um, the difficulty and hardship of of the the, the reality there. Um, I think that, um, that if the challenge then is how do we open a wider lens, not to dismiss or diminish those realities, but how do we open the broader lens? And I was with a team of reporters in New York um, about two weeks ago at WNYC and had this exchange with a, with a reporter who was asking about, you know, she's having to do yet another story about gentrification and the difficulty and, and all the tension around it, et cetera, et cetera. And what the conversation began to center around was that, you know, what would happen if you went? And she was describing this one woman she had interviewed and, you know, who's going to lose her children in her home. It was just a very difficult story. You know, what if you approached her? to say, um, 
not to focus your question necessarily on um, the reality and the terrible story, but what if you were to recognize and say to her, you are a person who, you know, you're faced with a lot of um, challenges right now. Where do, where do you find your strength? Where do you go to find strength? How do you find so that So to just take that tiny little twist and how you're seeing that woman, not as a character to fill the news hole that you've got to fill back, you know, which is a reality, but actually see that person first and foremost as another human being and open your heart. Let yourself be vulnerable as a maker, as a reporter, and as a journalist to actually um, approach her from that really basic reality and truth. As um, far as an example of um, a potential resource for program development and producer mentorship, um, I would recommend looking at the Southern Documentary Fund, uh, which is out of Durham, North Carolina. Uh, you can find them online. Um, all of those, um, the films that they they help to mentor, the filmmakers that they help to mentor, typically do have to have um, something to do with the geographic region of the South. Uh, so that is definitely um, uh, not um, coastal or, or major metropolitan areas. Uh, many of those stories, though, right now, uh, many of those films that are being developed do reflect what's happening in our world today. And um, I think art always is a sign of, of what's happening in our world. Um, so I think that's also a great resource. Um, you might also look at, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but I believe that the program Real South um, is also a resource of the um, of the World Channel. I believe that it is broadcast via the World Channel. Mm -hmm. And if someone has a product, a film that's um, that's ready. Um, to share that that would be a, a great resource to look at. Right. I think just to sort of speak of the many organizations around the country, I think um, um, uh, Firelight Media in New York, VEVAC in San Francisco, um, uh, ITBS in San Francisco, they all have their different um, education and um, products that they roll out and frequently um, across the year, but I, what I really find, particularly at the regional level, is sometimes there are local film festivals that happen um, where there are some interesting panel discussions that are happening and education opportunities that are happening, and one of the things that I continue to encourage um, media makers who are looking for doorways is to engage these local regional film festivals. They may be really small and only happening for a day, but embedded within these film festivals are education opportunities. And so I encourage you to sort of to, to go to them. Um, our friends at the National Minority Consortium, for those of you who don't know what they are, there are five organizations where they are uh, funding and educating media makers uh, within their ethnic category, Center for Asian American Media, National Black Programming Consortium, uh, Pacific Islanders and Communication, Vision Maker Media in Nebraska, for Native Americans, uh, Latino public broadcasting out of LA. Nationally, they are working with uh, filmmakers of color uh, to get them educated and get them funded so they can create their content. Um, but it's also important to sort of just look at the film festivals, local media arts organizations. There's one in Philadelphia called Scribe where they're working with the community in Philadelphia. Um, and I think that's a, a good sort of um, place to start, particularly locally. Um, and I think, what else was in Michael's question here? Oh, gaps. Um, I Sometimes I get asked this question about um, why isn't there more stories about um, um, uh, political differences? And so if there is a gap, sometimes there aren't a whole lot of stories where you see different point of views presented about political differences. And so 
And I, I only bring that up because I get asked about that quite often sometimes. Thanks, all. Um, we have another question, and this is actually more, you know, um, a lot of the discussion today has been on the distribution side of sustainability, um, which is great, uh, but the person wants to know if the panel has any advice on the creation stage, um, how to connect artists, um, you know, to the funds that will actually get the project ready. Um, so do you all have any thoughts about the development side of sustainability? Well, I go back to what I just mentioned. Um, uh, particularly when, you, when you're working on an independent project, it, it takes a long time uh, to get it done sometimes, particularly when we're talking about a film. Um, and a lot of times what happens is you – you know, you need help with developing, you know, the proposal or, or, and getting that proposal in to get funding. And so there's, there's a life cycle for a particular film. Um, I think the, the most important thing is when we go back to some of these organizations we've been talking about, um, it's, you know, really important early on to sometimes find that initial partner, whether it's a funding partner or it's an educational partner, um, to get you started. Um, but it's also important to try to find some good mentorship from some existing media maker, somebody who maybe has a few films to sort of help. And the great thing about the independent film community is I see that happen pretty frequently where you have somebody with the first project, uh, you know, they go to somebody who's a, a master maker to sort of help them along the line, along the way. And I think it's important to sort of build those partnerships informally with independent creators and sort of get them to help get you started. And then as you find that first media partner, first funding partner, it is sort of, um, and does that help? <laughs> yeah, and what I would add on to that too, um, to what Chris is saying is that, um, you know, it takes years to cultivate, you know, it usually takes years to cultivate a relationship with someone who's going to fund your work, right? right. So that's something – that, you know, I talk to lots of producers and they just, they think there's this magic formula, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> here's how to do it. And so you really have to call to know how to, you know, use your network to meet the right people and, and, and use, your, you know, beyond your professional, use your social network just to find the right people and begin to engage relationship. But the, the one thing I would say, um, the other, and it's, these things go a little bit hand in hand is a lot of producers come to me and, and want to know, like, where to start, or they have this big idea and they don't even know where to begin. And I think one useful thing to think about is how to stage out the work. So the first stage is to, just to start small and think in terms of pilot. Think in terms of a pilot phase where you're going to you're going to be able to do something on a scale that's affordable and maybe even bootstrap it, but where you can start to put your idea down and, and make it real in some form that somebody can really get it um, and stage it out. So thinking pilot phase where you have this freedom to test assumptions, um, see what works, see what doesn't work, and it, it's, it becomes a vehicle for building those relationships. Thank you all so much. And, oh, I'm uh, – Teresa, did you have anything that you'd like to add? No, I was just going to add on quickly to what Sue said um, as far as staging things out. What might start as a very, very short film uh, might eventually um, catch the eye of um, individuals who could be much uh, more helpful in developing a larger project. So absolutely start small. And to build on that, too, just from a, a federal funding perspective, there is an ecosystem that supports the arts in different ways, and a lot of times that does include the art of storytelling. Um, so the production of film can sometimes be supported through uh, local state arts agency funding, funding through uh, state arts agencies as well. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of different entities to just be aware of as a, as a maker, and I think it's the responsibility also of organizations in the field to really – Pass on, pass on that information to their constituencies so that they know about all of these um, very complex and sometimes confusing ecosystems of 
support that are available to them, but it's about making these connections. So um, asking questions is so great uh, because there's always more things to learn. Um, and that's a vague statement, but it's an important one to remember. So I'm going to pass this over to Sarah Burford again. Thank you, and thank you all so much for your input and conversation today. Before we close up, because we're getting to the end of the webinar, um, we'll just ask if our presenters have any last words or additional resources, parting thoughts that they would like to share. Um, I would just, you know, thank you all, um, Sarah's, the Sarah's and Sarah, Sarah, and Jack's. Um, for, for, you know, your commitment and for bringing us together here, but also, you know, the important um, bringing together um, that you've supported of different makers from across the field to talk about these things. It's so, so important at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. I, I would absolutely concur. This has been a wonderful opportunity, and um, I've – participated as a listener um, on the other three webinars, and it's just been a, a wonderful learning opportunity. And I would just chime in and say thank you for including World Channel, and um, I encourage any media makers who have finished content to submit it to worldchannel.org slash submit, and let's build a, build a relationship. Awesome. Wow, this is so exciting. And uh, I hope everybody on today's webinar tuned in, learned a lot, and is ready to uh, connect with some new colleagues in the field. So um, I consider this a success. Yay. So thank you, Sue, Teresa, and Chris. You guys are so amazing. Thank you for all the time that you've shared with us today and in preparation um, for today's webinar, which will be archived on our website. So for those of you who want to listen again because it's so good, or if you want to share it with your friends, uh, you can. So um, thank you, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see you next time. Signing off. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.